to the Go Hard Chick podcast. I am your host, Crystal Holmes, and today we're going to talk about all things yoga with our guest, Demetra Ford. Go Hard Chicks! You know, I love to learn the stories of people who may have started in traditional careers, but somehow found their way to health and fitness. And Demetra, she's one of those individuals. Demetra is a licensed attorney who recently retired from the practice of law, and she currently divides her time between her real estate projects and her yoga practice. Demetra practices and teaches vinyasa yoga. Her class is generally a vigorous flow in which she utilizes music and encourages her students to vibe and flow through each pose with grace. Demetra's goal is to share yoga with those people who may have never had the exposure to the practice. She realizes that some people have the misconception that yoga is only for certain people or certain body types or certain ages. Demetra likes to dispel that myth and remind people that yoga is for everyone, even those like her with a little extra junk in the trunk. So please, welcome to the Go Hard Chick podcast. Go Hard Chick, Demetra Ford. Welcome to the Go Hard Chick podcast, Demetra. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Crystal. I'm really excited about today's podcast because admittedly, I do not know that much about yoga. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this is going to be very beneficial for me and the listeners. So let's jump right in. Can you tell us what exactly is yoga? Basically, yoga is a combination of breathing and movement. I like to simplify it as just calling it a moving meditation. Each pose or posture, if you will, helps us to strengthen balance, further develop different aspects of our body. It can be a very physical practice. It can be a very relaxing practice. The practitioner actually has the availability to do with yoga what they want to do with it. Some people like to actually use it for strength building, while others like to use it more for relaxation. So it's really depending upon the individual and what their goals are as to how they want to use the movement and the breath work. So you can use it for both. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's pretty much what I do. It's, for me, it started out as a practice where I was needing something to help with stress. That's essentially how I became interested in yoga. And then once I realized how much strength was required to actually lift my own body weight. It became more of physical practice for me, more of a physical challenge as well. And it also helps you to to work on other things like focus and concentration and balance. I mean, it's really a combination of a whole lot of different things that you can do all for the benefit of the body, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's pull that apart a little bit. You mentioned that you got involved with it to help you with stress. Let's flesh that out a little bit. How did you stumble upon yoga? Did you research? What happened? So basically, if you recall, you and I were actually having a discussion about yoga several years ago when we worked together. And one of the things that happened for me, I was let go from the position and I found out that I had high blood pressure when I was trying to get some independent life insurance for myself. Um, And so once I realized I had high blood pressure, I stumbled upon a holistic doctor who basically brought me in and kept me in for a while to see if some breathing techniques would actually help to lower my blood pressure. And they actually did help. And so that is really what prompted my interest in yoga, me trying to figure out how I could better manage the blood pressure. And so I honestly, I began to do a lot of research about yoga. I began to watch videos. I stumbled across, there was a guy by the name of Steve Ross He had an actual yoga show called Inhale, and it was on Oxygen, which was channel 
by Oprah Winfrey, actually. I mean, Steve Ross was a very interesting guy because he was a part of a, a 80s band called Men at Work who had yeah. left music. And are you familiar with him? Yes, I, I, yeah. I used to Men at Work. <laughs> And so he became, you know, really heavily involved in yoga. So he had this show that came on every morning at 6 a.m. And that's really how I got started with yoga with him. I purchased the mat. I had no, I didn't know any names of any poses. I knew nothing about yoga um, other than the things that I had seen online. So you started in your living room, basically. I started in my living room. I started in my living room. And I would get up a couple times a week and just do yoga with him. And that's basically what I did, I guess, until I got my confidence up (laughs) to actually go into a studio. So yoga, I'm assuming from everything that you've said, it doesn't require any sort of previous fitness involvements or requirements. No. Only thing you need in yoga is a mat (laughs) and a willingness to listen to your body. Because what I found is that a lot of people just want to jump in head first and they want to know how to do the most advanced pose, but their body just isn't isn't prepared for that. It takes time. It takes some conditioning. And some of our bodies just they naturally cannot do certain poses, but there are always modifications to help people get as far as they want to get in a pose. So how long would you say it took you to get to a point where you could really progress in the practice? Well, what do you mean by progress? Well, you mentioned that, you know, people like to jump in and do certain poses, but their body hasn't developed the strength yet to get there. How long does it take generally to get there? Or is it an individual type situation? Okay, that's a good question. It is definitely based on the individual. It is most certainly based upon how often that individual actually gets down on that mat. There are some people who, like myself, I got on the mat almost five days out of the week. There are some people who just can't make that type of commitment. So naturally, you're conditioning and strengthening your body. You're helping the muscles to become more flexible. So of course, the more you practice, the more likely you'll be able to advance into, you know, more difficult poses. A lot of people can sometimes get a bit overwhelmed because they feel like they're not progressing enough, but, or quickly enough. But as with everything, I mean, it just, it just takes time. And the amount of commitment that you actually are willing to put into it will definitely have an impact on things like your flexibility and your balance and your strength. So for me, I guess I would probably say it took me about a good maybe year and a half before I was able to do some of the more challenging poses. And it probably took me about a year and a half before I even had the confidence to actually go inside of a studio. Okay. So how often do you typically practice yoga? So a good practice for me weekly will consist of maybe three to four times. Okay. And the duration can be about an hour. And so it just really depends on the particular day. It's definitely a practice where you have to listen to your body and what your body is telling you it wants to do or doesn't want to do (laughs) that particular day. There are some times when I pull the yoga mat out and I I get on the mat and the only thing I want to do is yogic breathing. And that is still the practice of yoga, even though I'm not actually doing any physical body movements. The actual controlling of one's breath is a practice of yoga. Okay. If someone who's never practiced yoga before but is interested in it, do they have to start in the studio or can they start at home? What would you suggest for a newbie? It certainly depends on the person's comfort level. You can clearly, there are tons of free videos on YouTube where you can actually start in your own living room. But I found once I actually entered into a studio that the the real benefit was having someone to help me with the alignment and hands-on modifications with the postures. One thing that you run the risk of happening when you're doing it at home, 
as a beginner is injuring yourself because you may be putting pressure on certain parts of your body, which of course will result in some physical issues. So my suggestion probably would be to start in a studio if you're comfortable with going somewhere and actually trying to practice for the first time. If that, again, is something that you're just not really prepared for, don't want to spend the money on, you can, of course, just start in your living room. But the greatest benefit is is actually having someone to help you with alignment and modification of the poses and the postures. Now, let me ask you this, just curiosity. What are some of the misconceptions about yoga that you found people have I think the biggest thing is probably whether or not yoga is an actual religion. And depending on who you're talking to about this subject, you may get various answers. It can be a spiritual practice, but as far as particular religion, I've not seen anything personally that says it's a religion. That probably is one of the biggest misconceptions. A lot of people actually end up finding yoga because they were having some issues in their lives. Someone suggested yoga for stress and they just become so involved in the practice and it may may feel like a religion to some. The other misconception is that yoga is only for certain people, certain body types, certain ages, that you have to have this certain level of flexibility, that you have to be able to touch your toes. That's probably the biggest response I get from people when I ask them to give yoga a try. They say, I can't even touch my toes. (laughs) (laughs) But it doesn't matter your body weight. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your race, your religion. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is your willingness to actually be engaged in the practice by, again, connecting breath and movement, because essentially that's what it is. Okay. So what type of yoga do you practice? So I practice a style of yoga called vinyasa. And vinyasa is actually a form of hatha yoga, which is probably yoga in its most classic form. But what vinyasa allows me to do is to go through a constant flow with my movements. There are some styles of yoga, let's say Iyengar, in which you're actually holding a pose, maybe for two minutes, maybe for three minutes. But with Mm. the vinyasa style, you're going from one pose to the next, and you're connecting those poses with the breath. So on each inhale and exhale, you're going and you're transitioning into another pose instead of pretty much striking a pose and holding it. There will be some poses where you will hold say, in a downward dog, because that's pretty much a resting pose, where you'll be allowed Mm -hmm. to gather and collect your breath, just like with some of the other poses. I'm thinking child's pose is another pose that a lot of people hear about when they think about yoga as another resting pose. So that's a pose even in vinyasa, where you may actually stay there, maybe for 60 seconds. But it's certainly not where you're going to be, let's say, in a tree pose, for 90 seconds or anything like that. It is a constant flow of one pose to the next. Um, And in a lot of vinyasa classes, instructors actually use music. So it's kind of like a coordinated effort of, of breath, movement, and music. So what kind of music? I'm just curious. <laughs> so it really just depends on the instructor. I have some classes that I've done lately where I'll have an 80s playlist. And okay. so the it just depends. It, it, and for me, it's all mood driven, like whatever, whatever vibe I'm feeling, that's the playlist that I set for my practice. But essentially, the music will oftentimes start off very slow, very easy, because at the beginning of the vinyasa practice, the whole thing is about focusing on your breath, and getting your body ready to actually connect with the breath through the movements. And so you'll kind of start at a real slow pace, conditioning your body, warming up your spine, and you usually start on the floor, like in a seated position. And then you just slowly, you know, the beat and the tempo of the music slowly starts to increase as you're trying to 
get your heart rate up. So vinyasa is actually a, it's a very, it's a pretty rigorous class because you are working on getting your heart rate up. And then once you hit like that peak, then usually the instructor will start with some, with some cool down poses that will get you back to the floor on your mat. So for me, a typical class is warm up poses that's started with breath work. And then you hit the peak and then you do some standing poses, you do some balancing poses, and then you end up on the mat doing some seated poses. And then you just finally close out each session the same way most yoga classes close out with the final pose of Shavasana, which is corpse pose, relaxation pose. So it's very important when you're when you're in a yoga class, like a vinyasa class where you're getting that heart rate up, that you actually have to take some time to actually do some poses to slowly get the heart rate back down before you go into the final pose of Shavasana. And so is the typical class, does it last about an hour? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are some classes, though, that are longer. There are some classes that are 90 minutes. But for me, I think a 60-minute class is a pretty good time frame for a good solid yoga class. Now, how did you decide on vinyasa? So I basically, I was what I called a a transient yogi, which meant I, for a long period of time, hopped around from studio to studio, just trying to figure out what worked for me. I mean, there's so many different styles of yoga. You have Hatha, Iyengar, Bikram, which is the hot yoga that everyone's always talking about. You have Ashtanga, and Ashtanga is a very intensive strength building yoga I liked vinyasa for the simple fact that there is a lot of fluidity in the movement. Certain styles like Bikram and Ashtanga, they have, you're using the same poses, but it's a set sequence of poses. It's like, this is the pose that's going to happen next. This is what's next. And it's always the same. It doesn't change. And for me, with vinyasa, I liked having the flexibility to kind of shake things up and mix it up a little bit and not being in that same routine of the doing the same poses in the same sequence all the time. Right. And vinyasa gave me that opportunity to be able to do that. And so that's just pretty much the style that I embraced. Now, what what are some of the benefits, I guess, for of yoga for women in particular? So I think... What I would have to say is stress management. If you've heard in the past, like the number one killer for women is like heart disease. Right. Then yoga would definitely be spot on for helping with something like, you know, heart disease, hypertension and things of that nature, which again is what I said is, you know, what got me into yoga. It definitely, the movements definitely will help you (laughs) to focus on the breathing, which of course will help with the stress management. I found that sometimes during the day, if I'm feeling like I'm in a stressful or an anxious situation, if I can just take some time to remember to do and practice some yoga breathing, then I'm all good. And so if I can actually make the time to actually even do a quick yoga, you know, sequence, that's even better. But the greatest benefit to me for women is the stress management. And then there's the balance and the focus aspect. The balancing postures are actually my favorite poses. My goal is to be able to take that balance that I have on the mat out into the real world because everybody could use the ability to balance everything in their life, work, play, family. Yes. And so when you're when I'm on the mat and I'm engaged in the balancing poses, that's one of the things I often say. If I could just take this balance into my everyday life, I would just be spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So there are mental and physical health benefits for women. Now, what if the woman is a little bit older? Maybe she's not in the best or the greatest physical shape anymore. Can she do yoga? Are there beginning classes for yogis? Yeah, I mean any there are classes for any level of any level of practice. So I had a session once where I taught 
some senior citizens. And of course, they were very limited in their mobility. Mm. And most of the poses that we did were done while they were sitting in a chair. And so that just goes to show that there is there is a way to modify these poses to accommodate anyone. If you have back issues, if you have knee issues, shoulder issues, a lot of times when you're in an actual yoga class, at the beginning of the class, the instructor will ask, does anyone have any issues that I need to be aware of? Because they will be able to give you some modified poses that won't put as much pressure on that knee or as much pressure on your back. For me, one of my problem areas, I really, the inversions, which is like headstands and things of that nature, I've not gotten to that yet, but I can do shoulder stands, but I don't do them often because it's not really the best pose to be in an inversion for someone who has blood pressure issues. Uh So there are some things that you have to take into consideration. Now, my blood pressure is, of course, controlled now. But if someone is still having some issues with elevated blood pressure, those inversion, you know, inversion poses would, of course, not work best for them. But ideally, no matter what a person's (laughs) physical state is at the time they decide to actually get on the mat, there certainly will be some degree of challenge. And you will feel some sensations. A lot of people like to call that pain, but I call it (laughs) sensation because you're introducing your body to different movements. And so you're naturally going to have some sensations in some areas where you may have never experienced that before. That's just part of developing your practice. Okay. So you mentioned quite a few times about, I guess, meditation. So explain Are yoga and meditation, are they the same things? Are they different? Are they incorporated with one another? So I I always say that yoga is a moving meditation. They're not necessarily the same thing, but they certainly are closely related. A lot of yoga classes actually start with a short meditation and end with a short meditation. For me, meditation was actually something that came, became a part of my life really later in my practice. You're sitting in these classes sometimes and you're ending these classes and beginning these classes with, with um, so I wanted to know what the um was about. (laughs) And so I started to do, what is the um about? So, (laughs) so um basically is like a sound of universal consciousness. So it's believed that at the time that you're saying that there is someone else, someplace in the universe on that same vibration, doing that same uh, uh-huh. sound. And so, so basically it's just a sound of, of universal consciousness. And, and it is a way that a lot of the yoga instructors begin and also end their classes. As with meditation, it just really depends on the individual, how deep they want to go into meditation. A lot of the yoga studios even offer like meditation classes. Now there are meditation gurus out here now that teach various styles of meditation. It could be something as simply learning how to control your breath or counting your breath to the count of four, holding your breath for four counts and then exhaling that breath for four counts. It could be reciting a mantra. It could be a walking meditation, which is something that I actually truly enjoy. Just it's just basically walking in a circle, which is something you can do in your backyard. And you're just one foot in front of the other foot as slow as possible. And the only thing you're concentrating on is the walk. A lot of people say, oh, I can't, I can't meditate. I got too much stuff going on in, a, in my mind. It's, it's not a practice where you're, you're supposed to actually stop thinking. It's a practice where you're actually just allowing those thoughts to just flow freely, but you're not getting connected to the thoughts emotionally. And so once you can allow your mind to do that, you're meditating. And, and it's really nothing, nothing more than that. It doesn't mean that you're not having like no thoughts running through your mind. You, the thoughts are going to come. You, you might sit there and you might think, oh, what am I going to eat after I get off this mat? 
<laughs> and then you just say, hello, thought, <laughs> and you let it go. <laughs> because we do, we do so the whole thing them. is... <laughs> We think about food, we think about, you know, all kinds of stuff while we're sitting on, on the mat, when we're supposed to be like meditating. We think about what we're going to do when we get finished meditating. Now, sometimes we start drifting and we're like, okay, how long am I going to be here? How long am I going to be sitting in this certain pose or this posture while I'm meditating? Because you can actually meditate in a pose, in a posture, in a chair, I always encourage people, if they're interested in meditation, just find whatever position is going to be comfortable for you. It could be lying in your bed. It could be sitting in a chair, sitting on the floor. People always envision somebody just sitting there with their legs crossed right, <laughs> and their arms, you know, sitting on their lap with their hands up. I mean, and some people actually do that. If it's comfortable, then, I mean, hey, make it happen. But a lot of people can't sit cross leg in lotus pose for an extended period of time or in lotus pose at all. And so in order that you can not be so focused on what you're feeling while you're just sitting there, I just tell people to just sit comfortably. So we touched on this a little bit, but just if folks are listening and they are interested in trying yoga, what are some suggestions that you would give someone that wants to get started? So I guess my first suggestion would be to, if you're not opposed to trying going into a studio would just be to check out some different studios. Now, there are different types of studios. I mean, there are some yoga studios that are strictly just focused on yoga as a physical practice. But there are also some studios that combine yoga with some spiritual work. And they're usually classified as as ashrams. Atlanta actually has a pretty popular urban Mm -hmm. ashram in the middle of the city, which I practiced there for for several years before I developed a solid home practice. But again, it just depends on the individual. And and just make the commitment to get the yoga mat, a yoga mat that's comfortable for you, because the mats come in different like thickness, they're made out of different material. You just have to try each of those options to see what works for you. Some people prefer to do yoga actually on a towel. They Mm -hmm. think that that gives them, I guess, more traction and they're not slipping as much. There are some people who use cork mats, like mats that are made out of cork. I have a mat that's actually made out of, that's made out of rubber. It's it's my travel yoga mat, but, and it it actually doesn't have any cushioning because I can fold it up and put it in my carry-on. But what I like about the mat is that I can get a lot of traction, not slipping. I can get an actual good grip. There are mats that actually have outlines and designs. So you actually know where to place your feet and where and where to place your hands when you're doing certain poses. So those are things that, you know, the individual will have to kind of research to figure out if they really need a mat that actually has the designs and the diagrams on it for them to you know, know where to place their hands or place their feet. You can get a mat from anywhere. If you just want a general mat, just to see if yoga is something that you're going to be consistent with, you can pick one up at, I don't know, TJ Maxx or Target. Or there's another store. What's that store called? Five Below. You can get a $5 yoga mat. (laughs) It's not something that you have to actually invest a lot of money in. And again, if you don't want to go into the studio, you have you have tons of video options. And and lately, there have been more people who are doing like live yoga classes online. So you can actually be fully engaged in these classes where the instructor can actually see you and direct you virtually. Okay, so you often see people or at least I do on photos and different things. They're practicing yoga in the little yoga outfits. What what do you have to wear? What can you wear if you're going to do yoga? You can actually wear whatever is comfortable for you. There's no there's no set requirement as far as particular uniform <laughs> for yoga. Some people prefer to use the spandex type pants or shorts, sports bras. Guys just wear shorts generally. But most women can wear anything that's going to be comfortable. Me, personally, I prefer something that's made of cotton that's going to have a breathable fabric and something that's going to allow me to have flexibility 
with the material. So generally, I wear a tank top, a sports bra, and some sweats. And so, or some shorts, it just depends mm-hmm. on, you know, how hot it is. So you can wear anything that's going to be comfortable. If you have clothes that you already use to go work out or go to the gym in, you can definitely use whatever you already have. There's no need to go out and get a whole yoga wardrobe. <laughs> right. <laughs> but definitely you want to make sure that it's something that that's going to allow you the ability to, to stretch and, and to bend and have some degree of flexibility. And no shoes, I take it. No shoes and generally no socks. Socks, I think, would make it a a little bit more challenging to maintain your grip on the mat. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who are very self-conscious about their toes. (laughs) Um, There's not a yoga instructor that's going to make you take your socks off if you decide to wear socks into the studio Okay. Um, but what I found is that it really does help to not have on any anything on your feet so that you can actually be directly connected with the yoga mat so that you're not slipping and sliding when you're trying to come in and out of poses. Well, and I imagine that if other people are in the class, nobody's really going to be focused on your feet because uh, there's... <laughs> <laughs> no. They're not, but some people are just so really self-conscious about something like that, like about their toes or anything, you know. Right. But yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody's going to be looking at anybody's feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Denise, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. This conversation was very helpful for me and it's piqued my interest in the practice of yoga. So maybe I'll give it a shot. but let me ask you if people wish to contact you or to learn more about yoga or take a class how can they reach you i can be reached most easily via email at rhythmic vibes yoga at gmail.com and that's r-h-y-t-h-m-i-c-v-i-b-e-s-y-o-g-a rhythmic vibes yoga at gmail Well, thank you so much for joining us, Demetra. And I, like I said, the conversation was very, very helpful for me. And I wish you the best of luck in your future goals with your practice. Okay. And thank you for having me. And I look forward to seeing you on the mat. All (laughs) righty. I really love this episode today with Demetra. It just goes to show that anybody with any kind of background, educational background, physical background, health background, can begin to incorporate healthy lifestyle routines such as yoga. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcast. Leaving a rating and review helps me to continue to bring you awesome content by building this community. Until next time, go hard chicks. Take care.